So a little while ago, I was asked to design and build two platform beds. And in the initial discussions, the term Fuji Attic was uh, thrown at me. And if you don't know what that means, neither did I. So I had to do some, some research on that one. And a quick Google research turned out it's a Japanese style platform bed, uh, very low profile, uh, usually very close to the ground and simplistic design. Um, what the client didn't like in all the pictures they found was an open slat design, like this one, for example, or something like this. And they also didn't like that some of the designs didn't leave a lot of air circulation and breathing room for the mattress. So the design we came up with is a, uh, a frame with mortise and tendon joints and the slats rabbited into it. And they also wanted to elevate the whole thing a little so they can put some baskets underneath. So this is the design that we came up with for two twin mattresses that they have. And they wanted to use it as guest beds with the option to push them together. So in addition to the size of the twin mattress we, we went a little bit bigger so once they they push the frames together and the mattresses together there's still a nice and even reveal all around so we decided on a mortise and tenon joint for the corners with a bit of a radius just to make it look a little more appealing and the slats rabbited into the frames so that when the mattress is on the frames you won't see the slats but it gives nice room for air circulation underneath. And I thought, since I designed this in Blender anyway, I might as well turn this into something like a product presentation like you would find in a, in a furniture catalog. Yes, they still make them. This is what I came up with. Nice and clean, simplistic looking, complementary to the bed frame. And in this video, I'm gonna run you through the process of modeling the beds, texturing it and setting up this scene to just have a simplistic backdrop for it. Little side note, um, I keep this as beginner friendly as possible, but you should know your way around Blender, at least the basic functionalities, where everything is. It'll help you a lot to follow along. So let's get started. Let's start with setting up our Blender scene first. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're using the metric system with millimeters here under our scene tab and units and then for our render settings let's look at the output first uh, we can go with a 1920 by 1080 and under our render settings because it's supposed to be like a catalog image they're usually very high polished so I want to preserve as many details as possible before the denoiser takes away some so I'm gonna double up the default render samples I'm gonna keep the noise threshold at 0.01 and for denoising I'm gonna use the open image denoise with accurate settings and I'm gonna use my GPU for it I'm gonna bump my, my light bounces all the way up to 12 And for the color management, I'm gonna use AGX and high contrast. And I might play around with the curves a little later on, but we'll see about that. All right, let's start with modeling the frame. So let's start with adding a cube. Shift A, cube. And under item, I can give it the pro appropriate size. For the length of the bed, it needs to be 2083 millimeters. And because it's out of made out of two by four material, um, the width is gonna be 89 millimeters and the height 38. And because I sized this in object mode, my scale is gonna be out of whack which I'm gonna have to remedy so the modifiers and everything and the texturing and everything works properly. So I'm gonna hit Control A and apply the scale. And I'm also gonna rename this into frame side. Those are gonna be the two side pieces of the frame. 
And then I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate it. And I'm going to right click to cancel the movement. Hit R Z 90 to rotate it by 90 degrees. And then I can resize this one. It's still on the X axis because I rotated it by 90 degrees, even though visually it's it's on the Y axis now, but we'll fix that in a second. So I'll change this measurement to 1016. And we have the same thing about the scale again. So we're going to hit Control A, Scale. And this time we're also going to hit Control A and apply the rotation. And that way the 1016 are now in the Y direction. So now we have two pieces. The short one is going to be frame top bottom. Now we got to move them in place. So instead of making two of each and working on four corners and all that stuff, um, I'm going to make it a little easier and we're going to mirror everything over into place. So that way we only have to work on a quarter of the whole frame and that makes the whole process a little easier. So first we got to move everything in place and for that I'm going to activate my snapping. So up here in the middle, I'm going to change this from increment to face but I'm not gonna toggle this little magnet here because when I do and I start moving stuff around, it's always gonna snap to everything and go wild and crazy, which is definitely useful in some cases, but in this case, I don't want that. So I'm gonna deactivate that. And, and instead, when I move it, I'm gonna hold control when I, whenever I hover over where I wanna go. So I want to move this along the x-axis till it lines up with this face. So I'm going to hit G, X, and I'm going to hover over this face and hold control and left click. And that'll snap it right there. Now I want to bring this over so it lines up with this face. So I'm going to hit G, Y to constrain the movement to the y-axis. I can't move it in any other direction. And I'm going to hover over the end face here, hit control, left click, boom, there we go. Now we have a basic setup. Now we got to start mirroring things over. So let's start with the long one here. And before I mirror it, I'm going to go into edit mode with tap and select edge. And I'm going to hit control R to put a loop cut right in the middle. And I'm going to hit right click to cancel the movement again. And I'm going to switch over to vertex select mode, which you can do either up here or in the pie menu. Box select the, uh, the four end vertices here and hit X and select vertices. That way I have made sure that I don't have an internal face here once I apply a mirror modifier to it. So I'll go back into object mode and I'm gonna click on my little wrench icon here to go into the modifier section. I'm gonna hit add modifier, generate, mirror. And by default, it's already set to X axis, so it's gonna mirror it over to X. And I also wanna to toggle clipping here. Because if I switch back into vertex mode and I don't have clipping enabled, and I select these vertices, I can pull the mesh apart. But if I enable clipping, I won't be able to do that. And that's what I want. Okay, well, so we're gonna jump back and forth between the pieces a little bit. It'll all make sense in the end. So we're gonna do the same thing here. I didn't go into edit mode, edge select, control R, and put a loop cut right in the middle. Right click to cancel the movement. Back into vertex select. Now, why do I switch to vertex select? Um, if you stay in edge select and you select these edges and hit control, uh, hit, hit X and delete just the edges, these edges will remain. 
even though there's nothing connected to the end anymore, but the edges will remain. So that's why I switch over to vertex select. The same would happen with the face, by the way. So that's why I switch over to vertex select and delete the vertices. And that deletes anything that is connected to it up to the next vertex. Okay, same thing here. We're gonna add a modifier mirror. And this time we gotta go the other way. We gotta go in the Y direction. So we're gonna deactivate the X and activate the Y. And there's our first half of the frame, basically. So now we gotta mirror this one over here and this one over here. And I'm gonna do that with the help of an empty, which I can later on also use as the master control for moving the bed around without having to, to join all the pieces into one big mesh. So that makes all a little easier. So I'm gonna hit Shift A, add an empty plane axis right in the middle. And I can scale it down a little bit just so it's not over proportion compared to the bed. And then I go back to my pieces and I'm gonna add a second mirror modifier. Add modifier mirror. And this time I wanna mirror this along the Y axis. So I'm gonna hit Y and turn off X. And I'm gonna use this empty as the mirror object. So I can either use my eyedropper here and select it here or in the outliner up here. Or I could also choose it from the drop down menu. But if you have a more complex scene with lots and lots of objects, this uh, drop down menu is usually not very helpful. Uh, that's why the eyedropper is the way to go. So I'm just gonna select my, my empty and it's gonna mirror it right over. I'm actually gonna call my empty bed frame master and later on I'm gonna parent everything to it too so I'm gonna do the same thing here add another mirror modifier this time going along the x-axis choose my empty and there's our bed frame so now we have these corners overlapping exactly the way I want it because this is where we're gonna add and model our mortise and tenon joint and because everything is mirrored we only have to do this once and it's gonna be the same on all four corners isn't that beautiful i'm gonna start with adding a bunch of loop cuts on one part and on the other part and then we're gonna start extruding faces and squishing everything together and moving pieces around the way we need it so let's start with the short one here the short one is the less complicated so i'm gonna tap into my edge select mode and i'm gonna cut this into thirds along the thickness and do that by hitting Control r while hovering over this edge here and i'm gonna scroll up with my mouse wheel once to make two loop cuts and that cuts it in three equal pieces and hit left click and right click to cancel the movement. Now I'm gonna need another loop cut here, which lines up exactly with this edge. So I'm gonna hover over one of these edges here while hitting Control R. And because I still have my face snapping active, I can hit Control while hovering over that face and it's gonna line up right there. And now the last loop cut I need to do here is right down the middle of this one because the long piece is going to get the rabbit where the slats are going to sit in and this one won't have that so i need to make a loop cut right down the middle here so again Control r hover over the edge left click and right click to cancel the movement okay let's go back into object mode and then we're gonna work on the other piece so this is a little more complex because not only do we have to do our mortise and tenon joint here, but we also have to cut a notch in here where the feet are going to be glued in. So I'm going to do that first because I have a specific measurement from this edge in. And once I have a couple, bunch of loop cuts here, I would have to calculate that or let Blender calculate it, which is very much possible. But why make it complicated if we don't have to? So 
I'm gonna tap into edit mode. I'm gonna make a loop cut here. And I'm gonna slam it all the way over here. Now I'm gonna move it on the X axis in a negative direction by 402 millimeters. So GX minus 402. And this is where I'm gonna cut in my feet later on. So I'm gonna make another loop cut here and move this all the way there. And I'm gonna move it back in the negative X direction by 38 millimeters. So GX minus 38. And this is where I can make my notch later on. So now one more loop cut this way. Same as on the other piece, it's got to line up with this edge. So I'm going to hit Control R here in this part of the board, hover over the face and hold Control and click. Now, similar to the other piece, I got to make thirds here. So let's start with this. Hit R, Control R, that is. Um, hover over this edge and scroll up once to cut it in thirds, cancel the movement. But I also need to make another cut right down the middle for my rabbit. So I'm gonna hover in the center here, Control R and do another loop cut right there. And I'm also gonna make one all the way down the length here. So Control R, left click and cancel the movement. All right, now we have our basic layout and now we can start extruding things to make our joint. So just like we had, wait, where is it? There it is. Basically on the short piece, we got to extrude faces once to there and once to all the way where the other piece ends. And then on the long one, we got to extrude everything towards the X direction. So let's start with the long one. Long one is relatively easy. If we're looking here, the long one, everything that is in the middle gets extruded all the way to the end of this board. So we're going to take, go into face select and select these four faces. Now, if I were to hit E to extrude, and I was going to bring them in, it would leave these faces, which I do not want. I can, if I hide the top bottom quickly, it will leave these faces and I would have to go in to delete them and make it complicated. But what we can do, and I'm going to reverse this and I'm going to switch over to edge snapping. And instead of hitting E, I'm going to hit Alt E and choose Extrude Manifold. And that is gonna take the whole thing all the way to the next edge. And that saves me a lot of time. And let's bring in our bottom piece again. And that's basically on the mortise and tenon joint all we gotta do for, for this part. But now we gotta make the rabbit. So we're gonna select all these top faces Hit Alt E Extrude Manifold and I want to bring it all the way to the middle. Now because I crossed another edge, it's going to leave these faces on there. Um, the other option would be to hit Control E Extrude Manifold to the first edge and then do the same thing again to the second edge. And that way I don't have to delete anything. But I have my rabbit all the way. And now this is basically done for now. You can also take these two faces, Alt E, Stroop Manifold to the first edge, Alt E, Extrude Manifold to the middle edge. And then all I gotta do is delete this face. And this will be covered by the foot later on. And the feet are also going to get a five degree angle. And once the foot is modeled, we're going to adjust the cutout to it. Cool. That's the extrusions on the long part. 
So now all we got to do is extrude the pieces here. Let's go back into object mode and we're going to select the top bottom piece. Go into face select and we're going to take the top face first. Now we're going to hit Alt E extrude manifold to this edge and this face Alt E extrude manifold to the first edge Alt E extrude manifold to the second edge. Now the only thing we still have to do, I could have extruded it downwards the first time but I forgot. So let's do that quickly. Take this face, Alt E extrude manifold to this edge. Uh, let's go into local view by hitting slash on the numpad and this face and the second face here. The vertical one is not necessary, so back into face select. Select this one and this one and X to delete the faces. Out of local view by hitting slash. And now we have the mortise and tenon joint just the way I ended up building it. So last thing we gotta do is make our little radius here along the corner. So let's go into edge select mode. Oh, wait, before that. Let's just select them both. Then go into edge select and select those three edges. Hit control B to bevel them. And I'm going to scroll up on my mouse wheel. Um, let's give this about 12 segments. And I'm going to open my last operation menu down here. And I'm going to change the width to exactly 38 millimeters okay back into object mode we're gonna shade it smooth here pretty soon and that way we'll get rid of the sharp edges here along the, the corners but for now we're just gonna leave it like that okay with that we have our frame at least the top of our frame so let's do the feet next so i'm gonna add another cube shift a mesh cube it's fairly big right now. In Y direction, we need to have the same measurement as this one. So that's going to be 1016. In X, it's going to be 38. Same material. And the height of them will be 255. And now to make everything a little easier, first and foremost, I'm going to call this feet feet you can spell it helps and i'm gonna add a mesh plane which i'm gonna need later on anyway i'm gonna scale this up a little in general and i'm gonna scale it along the x-axis i'm gonna adjust the rest later on i'm gonna call this floor i'm also gonna move it into a different collection by hitting M, new collection, and this is going to be part of the backdrop. Hit OK. Well, I can also rename my main collection here into bed frames. Now, I want to bring this up onto the face, onto the floor. I'm going to switch back over to face select, uh, face snapping. Uh, move this up on the Z axis and then hit G Z and hold control on the floor. I'm going to go in my front view by hitting the tilde key and hovering over front or hit seven on the number key. And I'm going to take my two frame pieces and just move them up for now. They don't have to line up just yet. Now I want to line my foot up with my notch. So in order to do that, I'm going to switch over to vertex snapping and with my foot selected i'm gonna hit g x and hover over these vertices and now as i mentioned i'm gonna rotate them by five degrees so i'm gonna hit r minus five and i'm gonna have to move them a little bit further because i want this corner to line up with this corner. So I will do that by hitting GX and hovering over that vertex. 
Now, because we rotated this, we're clipping into the floor a little. So we got to remedy that by selecting the bottom vertices, shift that to go into wireframe mode. And then we can hit GG to edge slide them along their respective edges. And for that, I'm going to go back to face snap, hit GG and snap it to the floor. And I got to do the same thing with these ones. Now, because I would have to go past their current position, when I double tap G, I have to hold down Alt to be able to go past their current border. So G, G, and if I were to just try to move them past it, it would just slide along the other edge. But if I hold Alt, it'll let me slide them basically where that line would continue. And then I can hit my Control 2 to snap it to the floor. And that way I can move them and adjust them without changing the actual thickness of the board. So let's go back into front view and do the same thing with these ones. Let's go into wireframe, select this row, GG, Alt, and snap it to there. Uh, might be better to switch to vertex. Let's see, GG. No, let's switch to H. GG. There we go. And now we have to move everything. Hit A to select everything. Go back to vertex snapping. And hit GX to snap it to that corner. Now we can take this one and go GG. Hold Alt to go up and snap it to that vertex. So now we have our foot at five degree angle. And now all we got to do is adjust our frame so it lines up with the foot. So we go back into front view and select our frame piece. I'm going to activate edge snapping. Go into vertex select wireframe mode and I'm gonna move, move these over then these then these and then these so GX hold control to activate the edge snapping and move it there and then same with this one GX snap it to the edge and over on the other side the same thing GX snap GX snap now something is not quite right. Something didn't snap properly here. Mm, the foot seems to be a little out of whack. So let's go back here. GX. This is what happens when you're modeling. There's always adjustment. Mm. I'm gonna go back to vertex snapping quickly. And just snap this to the corner. And then back to edge snapping on my frame piece. Nope, vertex snap. Uh, GX, snap it. GX, snap it. And now it lines up perfectly. Go back into solid view. We can now see that everything lines up nicely. And all I got to do here now is basically do the same thing as I did with all the other frame pieces. Make a loop cut down the middle. Select the vertices at the end here. Hit X to delete the vertices and then add a couple of mirror modifiers and also apply my scale. So add a mirror modifier along the Y axis. Make sure clipping is enabled. 
and then add a second mirror modifier along the x-axis with our bed frame master as the mirror object. Wonderful. Now all that's missing to the bed frame is the slats and then we can start UV unwrapping it and texturing it. So I'm going to add one more cube And I'm gonna make this 19 millimeter thick, 62 millimeters wide. And for the length, I'm just gonna dial it down. And I'm gonna move this up. And I'm gonna face snap it to there. And I'm going to face select, select my end face here. G, Y, snap it there. And the other side too. GY snap it there. I'm gonna apply my scale. And then I'm gonna move this on the X axis down to about there for now. And it sits in there nicely. So now I'm gonna, instead of making more and more objects here, I'm just gonna make an array. And that way I can adjust how far they are apart and how many there are without actually having to deal with multiple objects. So let's add a modifier, generate array, and I'm going with a constant offset instead of a relative offset. That way I can be more precise in my measurement here. And I'm gonna do this on the negative side. And I believe, let's double check how many I had in there. We yeah, had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So oh, let's make 13 slats. So I'll give it a 13. And then I can adjust the offset. If I hold shift, I can do it in smaller increments. I'm going to top view and move this around a little. Don't quite remember what I had as a distance, but I can just eyeball it for this one. So it's about an equal distance, looks about right. And I'm just gonna call my object here slats. And that way, if I wanted to, I can always add more or less or make the distance bigger or smaller. It's just convenient. So now we have our bed frame modeled. Now we can start UV unwrapping it, give it some beveling and some shading smooth, and then we can get into the texturing. Okay, so let's start with the slats because they're the easiest ones. So all we gotta do here is give them a, a very slight bevel. Because all I ended up doing was just break the break the edges a little. So I'm gonna give it a 0.5 millimeter bevel. And we can actually leave it the way it is. Because when I break the edges just slightly, it gives you a little, little bit of a chamfer, but very slight. That's pretty much all we gotta do for this, apart from texturing and unwrapping. So let's go into edge select and I'm gonna go into local view to work on it. And I'm also gonna deactivate the array modifier in edit mode. So I only see this one object. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the end edges and one on the bottom because in the final render we won't see this. I'm gonna right click and mark that as a seam. And then I can go into face select, hit A to select all the faces and then hit U, unwrap. And now we've created a proper UV map for our board so we can texture it later. So back into object mode, out of local view, and let's start on these ones. Same thing, I'm gonna go into local view by hitting slash and I'm gonna deactivate my mirror modifiers in edge in, in edit mode. So the first thing I want to do, I'm gonna unwrap this. So first I'm gonna select all the sharp edges up here by select, select sharp edges. And now by control box selecting some of these, I'm gonna deactivate these ones because I don't want to unwrap those. And I also don't need to unwrap that because you won't see these pieces. They're not so crucial. So I'm not too concerned about properly unwrapping these faces that won't be visible anymore after. Normally what I would do is 
have only one seam so the texture wraps completely around it but because we have this bevel here um, with the radius on it that will make it a little more tricky and so with the way we'll look at the model in the final renders having all four sides unwrapped separately makes sense with all these edges selected I'm going to right click and mark them as a seam, hit all the faces and you unwrap them. Go out of local view and now I need to bevel this. Now if I add my bevel modifier, by default it goes by the angle as a limit method and it's just going to apply it to all the angles. which gives me trouble in our modus and tenon joint because what I want is a two millimeter bevel, a nice round over. And this gives me trouble here because I don't want anything beveled there. So I'm going to switch my limit method to weight. And that way I can define precisely which angles get the bevel, which on this piece is only the four edges that have no connection to anything. So if I go into my edge select, I'm going to select all these edges that don't connect to anything else. And up here in our transform menu, I'm going to go to edge data and the mean bevel weight dial this all the way up to one. So now Blender knows to apply the bevel modifier to only these edges. And here where I have my mortise and tenon joint, I'm going to have my nice and smooth flush transition. So now all we got to do is shape this smooth to get rid of all these sharp edges. So right click shade smooth. And because we have a bit more complex geometry than just a cube, um, we got to shape this smooth by angle and since Blender 4 point, I think 1, we got to do that with a modifier. I have it in my quick favorites, but you can find it under modifier normals, smooth by angle. And on our bevel, I'm also going to harden the normals so it doesn't try to distort the, the flat faces too much with our segments. Now in the modifier smooth by angle, we might have to play with the... Uh, the angle a little because on our bevel there's still some sharp edges so we just got to slightly increase our angle there and that way we get rid of the, the sharpness so now we got to apply this thing to the long pieces and instead of going into the mod modifier menu again and applying all these i'm gonna shift select the one we already did i'm gonna hit Control c and I'm going to copy selected modifiers. And I'm going to choose my bevel and my smooth by angle and hit OK. Now, nothing happens yet because first and foremost, we still got to shape this smooth. That way we get rid of that. And then we still got to define which edges on this piece get the actual bevel. And we also got to un unwrap this first. So as before, I'm going to go into local view, go into edge, and I'm going to deactivate all my modifiers in edit mode, except the smooth by angle. That, that can stay. That's okay. And just like before, I'm going to select my sharp edges and then deselect what I don't need. So I don't need this. And I don't need this one or this one. Uh, da, 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 da. I can leave those. They won't be visible, so that doesn't bother me at all. That looks pretty good to me. I could deselect these ones. Yeah, that looks good. So right click and mark them as a seam and then go into face select all you unwrap now back to our edge selecting we gotta define where we want to bevel so we're gonna have 
this edge and this edge and this edge all along all of them up top here i can hit alt and select the loop but i don't want this edge because this is going to be the connection to the other board and do the same thing here alt shift select all around here i don't want this edge that's correct i don't want these edges and I also don't want any of these edges because that's where the foot is, but I want the long one. And then I go back to my edges data and increase the mean bevel weight to one. And now if I tap back into object mode, I have my bevels. And again, I might have to play with the angle a little, increase it slightly just so it catches everything. Now if I tap out of local view, our bevel goes all the way around and transitions nicely between the pieces. So we're going to do the same thing on this one. Shade it smooth. Select this one. Shift select this one actually. Control C, copy selected modifiers. And we just select the bevel and the smooth by angle. Hit OK. And now we just got to tell it again where to apply the bevel and unwrap it. So let's go into edge select. I'm going to make a loop cut up here so I can end my bevel right at the corner here. So control R and move it up here. Control hovering over this face. Actually, before I do that, let's cancel this again. Control Z. Um, I'm going to make one loop cut right down the center. That is for unwrapping later on. I'll get to that in a second. And now I'm gonna get my loop cut up here back. So in terms of beveling, I want these edges to be beveled. Mm. I actually should make another loop cut here vertically. So let's move this one there and reselect all my my edges that I want to bevel. And go back to edges data, mean bevel weight up to one. And that way, if I go back, I have my bevel. Let's collapse these ones and increase that angle a little bit so the bevel is nice and smooth. Now there is a little bit of a a funky transition here but from a distance you won't notice that anymore so i'm i'm okay with that pretty much the same up here but that's okay you won't see it in the in the final render now the reason i wanted to have this loop cut that right down the center is because of the elevation of the feet i had to glue two boards together and i want to visualize that with the texturing later so i want to unwrap this so there it, it looks like two boards are glued together so i want to have a seam right down the middle here too so let's select what we want to unwrap and that is basically again select sharp edges and i'm just gonna add by holding shift and alt and selecting this loop cut now i have all my sharp edges selected and i'm gonna hit right click mark c i'm gonna select all my faces hit u and unwrap this it's gonna get a little more complex in a little bit once we actually get to the texturing, but we'll get there. So now that we have finished modeling our bed frame, we can get into the texturing. And originally I built this bed frame in Maple, but I couldn't find a decent free texture for a Maple veneer or something like that. Recently on Polyhaven, they released this Oak veneer texture, which is very nice. It's a very nice book matched veneer texture. Um, so this is what I'm going to use for this one. So I'm going to tab into my uh, viewport shading for now. It's going to be very bright. Actually, I'm going to get the floor out of the way for now. And I'm going to pull up my shading window. If you don't have this yet, so you might have either you have the timeline here by default. I think it's the timeline. So you can just click here and switch it over to shader editor. 
or if you don't have a window there at all, you can just hover over this corner until it becomes a little crosshair and then just pull up to split the window in two and then switch over to shader editor there. So I'm going to add a new material with any of my pieces selected and I'm going to uh, select my principal BSDF and hit Control Shift and T. And from there, I'm gonna search my material that I have already downloaded, which is a wood texture and it's Oak Veneer 01. So I'm gonna select my AO Diffuse Normal and Roughness. And because it's a furniture piece, it's gonna be sanded very, very smooth. I do not need a displacement map for this, so I'm not even gonna select it. The Node Wrangler add-on helps setting up the correct uh, texture setup already with the UV map connected into the mapping. Should this not work for you, you should go under Edit, Preferences, Add-ons and look for Node Wrangler and make sure that is enabled and that gives you the shortcut. Now it still doesn't connect the ambient occlusion though, so I'm just gonna quickly Shift A Throw a mix color node in here, connect it there. Set this to multiply and connect the color of the AO right there. And there we go. Doesn't make too much of a difference here. Probably could live without it too, but. So now we have it on the feet and on the long pieces already, but not on the short pieces. So I'm just gonna select a short piece here and then shift select the long piece and then hit Control L and link materials. And that way the material gets applied here too. So now that we have the uh, material on them, now let's quickly rename this material to Oak Veneer. And then we need to apply a material to the slats, which are gonna have a different material. I am going to use one from iMesh I'm going to use their wood 42. Um, another great source for, for material beside Polyhaven would be uh, Ambient CG. They get some nice wood textures too that work well for it. Uh, this one, for example, would work nice for the slats too, but I'm gonna use my, my eye mesh here. So I'm gonna import this material for there. It applies it right away. Now, because we have an array modifier, the texture is the same on all these slats, which I don't want. But we can easily remedy that in our array modifier if we open up the UV tab here and then just randomly offset that in both directions. It'll just randomly shovel the UVs around on the texture map wherever it has a new array. Next thing I want to do with the texture is I want to move it around a little. Because when you look at wood from its different sides, when you cut it open, um, this one might not have the best features. Uh, I'm actually going to show you on a different one. This is a piece of cedar. Mm. Some people sniffled glue sniff wood. So if we look at a piece of wood here and we look at the uh, squiggly side, squiggly, however you want to call it, um, the kind of squiggly pattern on the face grain, and we compare that to the edge grain, which is a more stripy one, um, that depends on how the wood is cut and it shows uh, the way the end grain goes. So whenever you kind of cut a, basically a tangent on the, the end grain, you get this nice and, and wavy and squiggly pattern. And if you cut right through the, the, uh, the rings of the wood, that's when you get that stripy pattern. So that's when you cut a piece of wood square, you always have one side that is a little more squiggly depending on how the rings are and one side is more straight. So let's try and simulate that on our bed frame here. Um, and we can do that over in the UV editing workspace. 
And we go up here and select our oak veneer diffuse. So we see the texture. And then on this one here, hit A to select all the faces. And then we see them over here in the UV editor. And now we can start moving them around a little so that maybe we have the little bit more stripey pattern on the side and the squiggly faces from here have them on the top. So let's hit A for selecting everything and just move this around slightly till we have something that we like. For example, this one, go back into object mode and that is actually pretty nice. Let's do the same thing on these ones here. Go into face select, select everything. Move them around a little. So we have a little more stripey pattern on the side here. You can also scale them around a little. So we have something that we like a little more. And I think that looks pretty good. Now let's do the same thing for the feet, which actually looks already pretty good. Let's leave it at that for now. Back into our layout. Now the one thing with image textures on wood is that we don't have end grain available, but we can sort of simulate it. So what I'm going to do on these feet, for example, is I'm going to select everything. And now I'm going to make a bunch of loop cuts. I'm going to hit Ctrl R and scroll up my mouse wheel to make a bunch of loop cuts. Let's give it about 10 cuts. I'm going to make one extra up here and I'm going to do the same thing on the bottom one. 10 cuts. I guess now I would have 12 cuts up there. So let's do 12 cuts down here too to have it somewhat equal. So now what we can do in our UV editing workspace is I'm going to select my faces here, control select them to take the shortest path. And now I can first and foremost move them into a more favorable spot by selecting them all and moving them maybe to something like this where it's a little more stripey. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select everything but the outer two. And I'm going to start moving them around a little. Bit by bit. And I'm going to hit control minus on the numpad to decrease the selection and keep moving. So I have a nice kind of radius on them. Doesn't have to be perfect. Because rings in, a, in lumber are never perfect either. And now to make that a little more believable, because the rings, when you cut through the wood, are always a little, they're usually a little smaller. I'm going to scale this along the X axis to compress it all a little bit. To something of your liking. Mm, something like this should look good. And that way we at least get the impression that we have end grain on this. And I'm going to do the same thing on the bottom. Move this into a favorable spot. Mm, somewhere around, somewhere where it's a little more stripey. Maybe there. I'm going to select the middle ones again. And GX and this time I'm gonna do it in the opposite direction because when you glue wood together you always want to have it kind of the opposite way so it, when it works it works against each other and not with each other it's better for the joint but I don't want to get too technical on that one so we'll just go in the opposite direction Move these a little. And we could also rotate them slightly. And then scale it on the X axis again to compress it. Maybe a 
little more so it's not exactly the same as on the top there and that way we can simulate the end grain and now i'm just gonna re-unwrap the uh, faces here you can just shift and alt and select those loops and hit u and unwrap them one more time and they're a little too small what i'm gonna do i'm gonna hit a to select everything and scale it down a bit we'll do both directions no just on the x-axis just to scale it down a little i'm gonna move it along the x-axis that looks a little better actually on these ones i don't like that it's mirrored that way so i'm gonna take one of the mirror modifiers which is the first one and i'm going to apply this and i'm gonna go in there one more time hit you and unwrap these that looks a lot better now we have the same issue though on these corners here and there it's a little more complicated because we have a, a radius on the corners with a basically smooth transition where it goes from the edge grain and would kind of swerve around into the end grain. So it's a little bit tricky to simulate that. What I did here is I'm gonna select this face. First and foremost, I gotta make a couple loop cuts here. So I'm gonna hit Control R and scroll up on my mouse wheel till they look about the same as the segments on the radius here and then i'm going to face select mode and hit control select and that way i get to my to my uvs of that corner and the select last selected face is this one down here you can see the different color and what i'm going to do now is just slightly bend them not too much just a subtle bend so that we can show that where the mortise and tenon joint basically grabs together that the grain changes direction so let's just uh, rotate that a little and move it Control minus rotate a little move it Control minus rotate move and we're just gonna do that a bunch more times and we won't don't want to go at a full 90 because that would be more than unrealistic so at some point the movement will have to be more subtle i just want to give it a slight angle just to show that the grain pattern is changing directions there i'm just gonna go a little more here Okay, that should be enough for these ones. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for this. I'm just gonna throw a bunch of loop cuts in here. And then go into face select mode and select these faces. Where are they? They're up there. So we're gonna start from there. Rotate, it's the same procedure again. I'm gonna speed this process up a little and I'll be right back. Okay, I should do it for this one. At least now we see that we actually do have a mortise and tenon joint there where the grain pattern changes direction a little bit uh, where it would switch into end grain and on these feet we have actually a kind of simulated end grain what i want to do now with this 
texture. First and foremost, I'm gonna go into my render mode and it's pretty dark right now because I don't have any lighting in there. So I'm gonna go to my world tab. I'm gonna drag a noodle out from the color and choose environment texture. Right now it's pink because I haven't chosen anything yet. So I'm gonna open, go into my HDRI folder and I'm going to choose the Brown Photo Studio 2, which is an HDRI from Polyhaven. And that way it gives me nice lighting. Now, the one thing I want to add to the wood texture, if I go back over to object, is that right now, if we try to get a reflection here, it's a nice wood texture because it has the, uh, it has a, a roughness map and a normal map. So it gives you the, the regular differences in sheen that you would get on a, on a decent piece of wood. But when I prepare it as a piece of furniture, I would seal it and coat it in, in some way, either oil it or varnish it or lacquer it or something like that. So we can simulate that in Blender too with our principal BSDF. If we open up this coat section here, give it a weight of one, Right off the bat, it's very, very shiny. Um, I sealed this one in the satin with a satin varnish. So let's bring this up to about 0.4, somewhere around there. It's a nice satin sheen. And then I'm also gonna take my normal map here and plug that in. Because even though you varnish it, you still get a little bit of that difference between the grain parts, but not as much as you would get the sheen. Um, I'm actually going to duplicate this here and separate it out so that, oop, nope, go into the normal, so that here I can dial the strength down to about 0.1. So it's a very subtle effect on that coating. So you would just get a little bit of it, but that way the, the wood actually looks like it's coated realistically. And I'm gonna do the same thing on this material. I'm gonna go into my coat and give it one and about 0.4, duplicate this, reconnect it to the normal map. Plug it in there and dial the strength back to 0.1. Just so we have a subtle effect. When we finish the lighting setup, it'll be a little more, more prominent and a little more visible. But yeah, with, with this, basically our texturing job on the bed frame is done. Looks good. We have our wood patterns. We have our end grains simulated. So now all we got to do is basically set up the scene, give it some backdrop and then set it up for rendering. Let's bring our floor back. And I'm going to add another plane, shift a plane, rotate it by 90 degrees on the X axis and move it back. GZ, make it an actual wall and apply my rotation. And I'm going to make it 2400 millimeters high, like an actual wall would be just to simulate it properly. I'm gonna scale it on the X axis. And so now I want to move my bed frame further back against the wall, but I have all these separate pieces. So this is the moment where I'm gonna parent everything, all these separate objects. I'm gonna parent them to my empty and that way I can just move the empty around and everything else will follow suit. So I'm gonna take my slats, that plane belongs into the backdrop and I'm gonna call it wall. I'm gonna take my slats, my frame, my side and my feet and I'm gonna select the uh, the empty last. So my empty is the, the active object. You can see it by a different color. I should go into solid mode, it a little more visible there. And I'm gonna hit control P set parent to object. So now everything is parented to my, why did I get the wall now? Now I accidentally got the wall parented to it too, which I don't want. So I'm gonna select the wall and I'm gonna hit Alt P to clear the parent. All right, back to what I was doing. Now with the uh, the empty, I can move it around and everything is follow, gonna follow suit. So that way I can hit G and then Shift Z to exclude the Z axis from movement. And then I'm, I can move it around till I 
have it close to the wall. Final positioning is when we get the camera later on. And I also want to make a baseboard here to make this look like an actual floor and a wall in behind. Activate this collection so it doesn't go into the wrong collection anymore. So if the, the collection has a little bit of a gray background, that means it's the active collection and any object that you add to the scene will get added to the active collection. So I'm gonna hit Shift A, add a cube. I'm gonna make this about 120 millimeters high, uh, 19 millimeters thick, set it on the floor and I'm gonna set it against the wall, grab these, GX, move them somewhere around here. That doesn't have to be too precise because they won't be visible. Drag these down here. And then I'm going to take the top edge and I'm gonna bevel it. And this looks a little funky. That tells me I did not apply my scale. So the scale is out of whack. Because the scale is a multiplier, the bevel would get multiplied in by those numbers in each direction. So I'm gonna hit Control A and apply my scale, go back into edit mode and try the bevel again. And now it works fine. I'm gonna bevel it something like this. And in my menu here, under the type, I'm gonna change it to custom and preset i'm gonna change it to corners molding nothing happened yet because we only have one segment but if we click and drag to add more segments then we can see something happening or 20 should be okay it's just a nice and smooth radius here and there that looks pretty good and then we can shade it smooth and add our smooth by angle modifier and that way we have a nice Nice baseboard. So next add some textures. I'm gonna apply the scale to my floor and to my wall too. I'm gonna grab some textures from Polyhaven and apply them. Those are actually some textures that I've used before. So I already have them and I saved them in my asset browser. So I can just open my asset browser, browser here and under materials, I go under wood and flooring. I wanna change it to this oak floor. I'm going to drop that on there and I'm going to change the UV and everything in a minute here. And then for the wall, I'm going to change it to the painted plaster to make it look like a almost like a stucco wall. So back to my shader editor and let's deal with the floor first. So first and foremost, I could go into face U and unwrap this. That way it's already the right direction. Now all I gotta change is my scale. And for that, I go to my mapping node here, click, drag down, select everything, and just move it around to a scale that I like. Something like this works pretty well. Now, in order to have a little more contrast, let's go into the render view. I'd like to have a little more contrast between the bed frame and the, the floor because we have an oak bed frame and an oak floor. Uh, it gets all a little lost in there. So I'm just gonna make this floor a little darker by dropping in a hue saturation value node. And I'm just gonna drop the value to something like a chocolatey stained floor. That way I preserve the wood grains, but I, I get a, a good contrast between a dark floor and a lighter, lighter bed frame. Maybe even a little touch darker. Yeah, that would be a chocolatey floor. So let's apply the same texture to the baseboard. Select the baseboard and shift select the floor. Control L link materials. And this is obviously a bit stretched. So I'm not too concerned about correct UV unwrapping there. So I'm just gonna, with my baseboard selected, I'm gonna hit A to select all the faces, hit U and then Smart UV Project. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that looks about right. It's going the right direction. That looks good. Now for my wall, um, it's a little big, maybe that pattern. So I'm just gonna bring the scale up to two, just so the plaster is a little bit finer. And I'm also gonna make this a little brighter by bringing in a hue saturation value again and bring the value up this time to about 
1.25. Now I'm not gonna rely completely on the HDRI because it gives me a little too much of a shadow. So I'm gonna add some more lights. So I'm gonna hit Shift A, light, area light. And before I do anything else, I'm gonna hit M to move that new to a new collection and call it lights. And move this up and over. I can drag this little yellow ball here and pull it onto my bed frame where I want it. I want it over a little on the side. I'm actually going to bring this out a little more. And in the settings for the light, I'm going to hit use notes and click on this little yellow dot to select black body to give it a realistic value. Because it's a photo studio, I'm gonna give it about 5,000 on the temperature. A nice neutral light. I'm just gonna play with the uh, exposure a little, bring this up. And then I'm going to duplicate that, move it along the X axis, take my little ball and move it to the other side of the bed, just so it's illuminated from all sides properly and we don't have too much of a shadow on the bottom. And at this point, I can start bringing in my camera. So I'm gonna hit Shift A, camera. I'm gonna hit Control Alt Zero to bring it to where I am from where I'm looking at. And I'm gonna zero out the Y rotation and I'm gonna put the X on 90. So everything is nice and straight. I'm gonna zero out the Z rotation too for now. I'm gonna lock the X rotation so nothing happens there. And I'm going to hit this little button here to lock the camera to view and then I can just move it around to where I want it. So leave it there for now. I'll zoom in a little. And under the camera viewport display, I'm gonna go and bring the passpar 2 all the way up. So I only see what's in the camera. So I would like to look a little from the top onto the bed frame. So I'm gonna use my, my Y shift here and dial this down a little. And I'm gonna bring my camera up again. I'm gonna bring this down to minus 1.5 roughly. That way I can look down on my bed frame without actually tilting the camera up and down or left and right and, and getting all the, the lines out of whack. So let's bring this in just a hair and over. I want to have it slightly off center. Maybe dial down the world settings a little. The HDRI is basically only there to provide a little bit of environment lighting and the two area lights give me the actual illumination that I want on my on my bed frame. So this looks about right. So all we got to do now is put some decoration in there and make the sign and then render it out. So let's make the sign first. Actually, I'm going to move my camera into a separate collection. Call it render. So I'm going to shift right click over there to bring my 3D cursor there. And I'm going to hit shift A mesh plane. I'm going to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees, G, Y to move it forward a little, and then rotate it on the Y axis by 45 degrees, and then scale it down a little, something like that. I'm going to bring it closer to my wall, so it almost looks like it's stuck on there, and then on this I'm gonna make a separate collection for that too. You can see I'm a bit of a neat freak. So on there, I activate that collection and I'm gonna hit Shift A and add text. Rotate that on the X axis by 90 degrees. And first one thing I'm gonna do is tap into edit mode and actually write what I wanna write, which is Fuji attic. Now I'm going to move this on the y-axis a little so I can actually see it. Scale it down a bit and move it there. I'm going to do this in viewport and in uh, material preview actually. 
So it's a little more responsive. So in my text settings, I'm gonna go hit font and I'm gonna choose a different one for this. And I'm going to choose, do, 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 I did Gabriola. Looks nice for this kind of sign. And now I'm gonna play around with the line spacing and all. So I'm gonna reduce the line spacing first and foremost. Uh, the uh, character spacing I'm gonna bring up a little. And I'm gonna shear the letters, kind of like so. And then I'm gonna rotate it up. And scale it and move it. I'm gonna do this out of camera view by hitting zero on the numpad. And then I'm gonna move it in place to something that I like. So now I'm gonna give this a little bit of geometry by going under geometry here and on the bevel, I'm just gonna give this a couple millimeters. That'll make it a little thicker too, something like this. Bring this further back till it's almost touching. I'm gonna give this a new material, call it text and all I really do there is give this a dark greenish kind of color something like this I'm gonna call this text Fuji attic and I'm gonna hit shift a and add another text rotate on the x-axis by 90 degrees and scale it down and this one is going to be platform bed. Bring this out. And on this text, I am going to give it center alignment. Maybe the Fuji attic is a little bit big, but let's scale this down a little. Ooh. A little bit up, call this platform bed. And for the font on this one, I chose Deja Vu Sans Contents. I'm giving the letter spacing a little bit more, more room there. And the line spacing, I'm gonna reduce a little. Place this there. And give this slight geometry too. Maybe a little less, maybe only like something like this. Move it back so it hovers over the sign. And I'm just gonna take this drop down menu and give this the text. And last thing I'm gonna do is for the sign. If there's a new material, call it sign. And I'm just gonna give this a bit of a shiny material. It won't show much at the end, just so it has a little bit of a reflection to it. Okay, that looks good. I'm going to select my camera and move it over along the x-axis just a hair. That looks good. Go back into the drop backdrop collection. And all I'm going to do is add a picture here and a plant, and then we're done. So I'm going to grab these from iMesh. Uh, polyhaven.com has a lot of stuff like that too. So feel free. Or a Blender Kit is good for, for stuff like that too. So be creative. Drop whatever you want in there. Choose something nice. Make it look nice. So I'm going to go with these. There's two in there. What I like about these is that one of them is actually meant to stand against the wall, which is awesome exactly what we have here i'm gonna delete this one uh grab this bring it down there g x bring it a little over g y bring it against the wall 
and I'm gonna hang a picture here and then we're done. I'm gonna pan these um, because it's glass. I have to go into rendered view, bring them forward just a hair. Mm, I already have a palm in here, so I'm gonna delete this one. Bring it somewhere up there. GY. Bring it against the wall. And there we have it. Let's do a quick save. And now we are ready to render this out. I'm gonna go into solid view. Double check our render settings. I got my exposure up to 0.36, roughly in that area. And let's do a test render. Okay, here we are. Um, I think I'm gonna bring the exposure up a little more. It's a little dark still. So let's go over to our compositing tab. And in color management, First, let's play with the exposure a little. Alt V makes this a little bigger. I hit N to close this. Yeah, it looks a little better. Maybe the writing is a little bit too bright still. I'm gonna dial this down a little more. Something like, like that. I want it to, to be a pretty dark green color. So I'm gonna render that one more time. Okay. So back into compositing. Yeah, I like this a little better. Um, because we did the denoiser at the end, uh, we're completely grain free, which is not realistic. Even though catalog images always have a very high polished look to them, I wanna have a, a very, very, very subtle grain. And we can do that right here in Blender. Uh, if we go over to our texture tab and hit new and I'm gonna choose clouds for that and for the color we go to color instead of grayscale and bring the size all the way down to zero which gives us this very very fine grainy pattern. Now in our compositor I can hit shift A and get a texture node. Texture. And I can choose our texture and we can even call that grain. And now all we gotta do is add a mix color node. And we're gonna set this to overlay and we're gonna drag our color into here. And now we have way too much grain, but with our factor, we can dial this down very, very much till we only have a very subtle effect. Yeah, about 0.2 should be good. And from here we can, if we want to play with the color balance a little. Color balance. if we want to. And maybe play with our hue saturation a little, maybe saturate the image a little more because AGX, while it is more realistic, kind of dulls most of the colors a little. I'd like to bring up the uh, saturation a little usually i would do that in an external software anyway in a in a in photoshop or uh, affinity or whatever you use whatever you have access to um photo p online would be free and easy and comparable to photoshop too uh but i'm gonna keep it in blender for now so uh this is basically it i'm just gonna render this out in 4k and see what the details do and then we're basically done. So in our output setting, I'm just gonna go 200% and render this one more time. And there we have it. You can see all the nice little details on our grain, the fake end grain on the heads of the, the feet, 
and the transition on our mortise and tenon joints and a nice presentation for our bed frame. And that's it. Again, in the original that I did was uh, pretty much without any compositing in Blender. I took it into a photo software and enhanced everything from there, brought up the separate saturations of the greens and everything a little. Uh, it gives you a little more flexibility on what you want to saturate and what you kind of want to keep uh, a little duller and bring up the exposure and clarity maybe a little bit. But for this, for the sake of this tutorial, this should be enough. We got a nice and clean, simplistic looking presentation for our bed frame. I think that should do it. Now, if you want to know how to get the measurements for this, for this model and take them all out of there or want to learn more about precision modeling in Blender in general, I've got a video for you just about that right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.